Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, this is O Culture, where we rupture your eardrums and rattle your cages with research from history's alternative thinkers. And despite all our rage, we do think what is lost can absolutely be saved. I am Ryan Peverly, your ceremonial master, the alchemist transmuting bullets into butterflies. As always, this transmission is assaulting your cochlea at 528 hertz, the miracle tone, the frequency of love. I know you feel that pulsation in your auric field. Don't you dare fight it. It's best to just let it finish. And I gotta tell you, we're gonna need some of that love after this one, because we've got one of the most knowledgeable voices in alternative media in the house to dish on some shocking stories from the not-so-distant past in the not-too-far-off future. We're talking Nazis in outer space, Antarctica, Nordic aliens, missing people, deep underground military bases, the end of the world. This is the audio equivalent of a sick-ass B-movie turned cult classic, and the star of this flick is Olav Phillips. Olav is a conspiracy researcher and writer specializing in the secret space program, exotic aircraft, high technology, foreign policy, prehistory, and mysterious civilizations. He is a regular contributor to several magazines and newspapers as well as the publisher of the legendary Paranoia magazine. In addition to writing and publishing, Olaf has also been featured on television shows such as Beyond Belief with George Norrie, America on Earth with Scott Walter, and UFO Hunters. Olaf also serves as an executive producer and principal researcher for Ground Zero Radio with Clyde Lewis, as well as having authored or contributed to several books, including his most recent self-published work, which is the foundation for our discussion here tonight, The Secret Cold War in Space, Soviets, NATO, Nazis, Alternative 3, and The Secret War in Space. Fasten those seatbelts, tray tables upright, because we're blasting this strange pod off into a strange land where Nazis zoom through space and the end of the world is nigh. Enjoy. Olav, hey, how are you, man? I'm alright, how are you? Doing well, doing well, thanks for asking. I've listened to you for, shit, shit, probably a few years now, just on various other podcasts, so... It's nice to actually get to speak with you. So thanks for being here. Well, thank you for listening and supporting me. Yeah, no problem, man. So I just want to tell you a quick story. About two years ago, I was walking through a flea market and I came across a huge stack of old Fate magazines. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're from uh, 1957, like a whole year's worth. And I have them actually sitting on my bookshelf next to me right now. That's awesome. So, yeah, so I, I grabbed them. Like the whole bundle was maybe like $15. And I read through a few of them. And they're really, they're really just kind of decorative pieces. But every now and then I'll pick one up and flip through it, right? And well, there's there's good go stuff ahead. in there. Yeah, absolutely. Like the, okay, yeah. so here's the top one. Um, let me grab it real quick. Uh, I practice black magic, the mysteries of the Kabbalah, <laughs> mystery of the green fireballs. I mean, yeah, there there's go. some really good stuff in there. But you're the first contributor to this magazine that I've spoken with, so I thought that was kind of a cool connection. Oh, yeah, yeah. I wrote a, I wrote an article uh, for Fate quite some time ago. Yeah. yeah, I can't say I've read it. I'm sorry. but <laughs> <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. I probably have about 100 of them myself. Do you have any that are that old, like the 1950s oh, like yeah. I have? Oh, really? Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't even know the magazine was still in existence until I picked these up two years ago and then searched them online. I was like, oh, wow, this thing's still being printed. Oh, yeah, Phyllis, uh, Phyllis Glade. She, she publishes it. Yeah. I like, you know, I like fate. I like the old stuff because, you know, it was a different time. You know, and, and the the quality of the way that it's written is different. I don't know. I, I like kitschy stuff, so there's something kitschy about it that I, I enjoy the old ones. What did you mean by it was just written differently? I don't know. You know, for a long time, I've collected old UFO documentaries, too. And I even have some of them on 16 millimeter. And there's more of a, there's more like drama in the way that it's written. There, there's more like... How should I put it? I guess it's more dramatic. It's more, you know, like edge of your seat, the way that it's written. Now, you know, because it's been hashed to death for so long, you know, it's like, oh, this is a UFO. It's circular. (laughs) You know, it's at (laughs) 45,000 feet. Where, you know, you get like Renato Vasco, you know, he wrote a book back in the day called Intercept. And it's like, Intercept with a, you know, exclamation mark. Are the UFOs coming to kill us? You know, it's, it's a very different, 
very dramatic kind of writing style. Well, it seems like they probably wrote with a little bit more imagination about the topics. You know, I mean, we... Yeah, probably. We know so much now about UFOs, for example, that it's kind of hard to approach it with that same sort of vigor. Yeah, the the other thing that I like about them is that they're somewhere in the translation, they're... There was a lot that was lost. Like there, when you go back and read that old stuff, you know, there's details in there that you don't hear about anymore. I remember, I think it's UFOs that has begun or it's uh, overlords of the UFO. You know, it was made back in the early seventies and they were talking about cattle mutilations. And this, uh, this rancher goes out there with a camera crew and he says, check this out. And he's got a black light and he's like shining this black light over the cow. And it's, there's like a phosphorescent paint or material that's on the cow. And then he goes to his other cows and shines it in like one, like one in four cows had this like phosphorescent paint that only showed up under black light. And it's like, you know, I've never seen that anywhere else Hmm. just on the one documentary. Yeah. Now you said that's interesting. What was I say? You said you collected old UFO documentaries. Is there anything specifically that, that stands out in your collection? Yeah, I have a. On, on 16 millimeter, I have a documentary. I haven't watched it yet, but apparently it was made by NBC in like 1971, and it's narrated by Rod Serling. Oh, it, yeah, and it's it's actually a an NBC TV documentary that was shown on primetime TV. But I've never, I haven't seen that one yet. But I I can only on the entire internet I can find one reference to it. Really? So it's yeah. just been kind of scrubbed from history then. Yeah, and and um, you know, like I I got these um, Ripley's Believe It or Nots, they're little ones on sixteen that were like shown before a feature. Like you know, when you go in the movies and you have that like real news and all that stuff when they show you like, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, did did you know that that this that this guy was in you know the Terminator or whatever? Well, they used to show uh, Ripley's Believe It or Nots, and I I have a bunch of these Ripley's Believe It or Nots, and I contacted the Ripley's believe it or not people in Florida. And I said, Hey, what do you know about these? And they're like, we have no idea what they are. And apparently what they are, I got them off eBay. Apparently what they are is they're, uh, they're pirated copies of the Ripley's believe it or not from like 1950, where they had actually copied the 16 millimeter. So I think that's interesting. (laughs) Yeah. I love those, just those little sort of niche cultural things that you can talk about or that you find like that. So I also have the, uh, on 16 millimeter, I have the official Vatican documentary on the uh, Shroud of Turin. Okay. So let's back this train up just a minute. So (laughs) the Vatican made an official documentary about the Shroud of Turin. Uh, Did that air anywhere? I don't know. <laughs> well, okay. I'm not now, sure. <laughs> now I have to ask, how the hell did you get a hold of it then? eBay. <laughs> well, okay. So eBay. what what makes it official then? They produced it. It was they produced it. The cameraman that they hired, you can find out about it on the internet, I think. But the the cameraman they hired was paid for by the Vatican. You know, it was a Vatican subsidized documentary because they wanted mm-hmm. they had Many, many years ago, they only pull that thing out every once in a while. And many years ago, they had a major investigation into the Shroud of Turin. And they invited all these forensic guys and forensic anthropologists and other people to to come and take a look at it. And, you know, that I think it's like one of two times that they've ever clipped, um, actually clipped a piece of uh, fabric off of the Shroud of Turin. Yeah, I think and I so remember hearing about that. Yes, yeah. right. So they wanted to document it. So they, they have... a film crew that documented the investigation. What did they conclude from it then? Well, I mean, it's subsidized by the Vatican, so of course they're going to conclude that it's real. Hmm. I mean, that's the kind of slam dunk, right? The Vatican paid for it. They're going to say that it's real. (laughs) Uh, Hey, that's actually a good segue into something that I I actually want to talk about later in the conversation, but since you brought up the shot of Turin in the Vatican, you actually contributed a few years ago to a book about the Ark of the Covenant. I did. And I haven't read the book. I didn't even know it existed until I started to research for this conversation. Sure. So I wanted to pick your brain on that just for a moment. The book speculates on what the Ark actually may be. And like I said, you contributed to it with several other writers as well. So what sort of conclusions did you guys come to about the Ark of the Covenant? 
My contribution to that book is that it's the Ark of the Covenant and other um, ancient lost weaponry or something like that. And my actual contribution to it was about a battle that took place in the Bahava Gita and the Vedas. So I didn't write specifically about the uh, Ark of the Covenant, but a lot of people believe that it's like a transmitter to God and that it it can do a lot of things, right? Because supposedly it could make food. It would destroy your enemies. Um, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of speculation about what it is because the um, the priests, the priest class that would take care of it, you know, they had to wear like special garments and people have analyzed the garments and apparently they were like anti-radiation suits. So, I mean, there's a lot of speculation as to what it was, but my part of it was actually talking about the Black Knight. The Black Knight satellite? Yeah. So, wait, you wrote about some battle in the Bhagavad Gita, but the Black Knight ties into that as well? Yeah. So, the, the first time that the Black Knight... In modern history, the first time the Black Knight was ever really dealt with was in the 1800s. That they they were sending in the turn of the century, they were sending radio transmissions from Scandinavia out into space, and they were sending to one particular spot. And when they would send a transmission out, it would bounce back. They call it a long delay echo. And you'd send it a transmission. If you keep sending transmissions, the interval between when the transmissions come back increases in prime numbers. And so I speculated that. In the ancient uh, Indian texts, in the Bhagavad Gita and the, the Vedas, they talk about this cataclysmic war between these two brothers, that these two brothers were like princes, and their dad was the king, and the, their dad had died, and they were fighting over the kingdom, his kingdom. And they had their own kingdoms, and they had this like cataclysmic war. And one of the last things that happened in the war, what kind of ended it, was that there was this massive attack on the one brother laid out this massive attack on the other brother. And in the, I think it's in the Vedas, actually, that it describes it. But they said that there was like a pillar of fire that had all the energy of the universe in it. And it destroyed his capital, right? And then after that, the war kind of fell apart. And what I hypothesized was that the, the munition that was fired that hit that hit that city, right, was actually fired from the Black Knight. And that a lot of what we consider to be the Black Knight, and then what a lot of the... What a lot of people believe is that that was actually a nuclear war because of the description of the pillar of fire and all the energy of the universe, etc. And I argued that it wasn't it wasn't nuclear because you can actually I forget the name of the town, but you can actually find it. It exists today, and there's ruins there, but there's like a crater next to it. And if it was a nuclear weapon, and it, even if it happened fifteen thousand years ago when it supposedly happened, there should be residue uh, radiation from a detonation of that magnitude, well, there's not. There's no radiation. I mean, there is, but it's like trace radiation that you'd find anywhere. And so I, I hypothesized that it was a kinetic energy weapon. And the Black Knight is very old. I mean, when they launched Sputnik, it's in Time Magazine, actually, that when they launched Sputnik, they actually, the ground stations in both the Soviet Union and here, track something following Sputnik around on its orbit. And at the time, they thought that it was the booster that they had used to launch Sputnik, but it actually followed it at irregular intervals. It would speed up and slow down. And then when we launched Explorer 1, which was our first satellite, it happened again. They found this thing like tri like kind of shadowing it. And so I argued that the Black Knight, as we call it, is a spent munitions platform from that war. And the reason that it go comes out and looks at the space station or looks at satellites or whatever is because it's an, it's a weapons platform. So it detects new stuff in its vicinity. And so it, the AI on board it says, Oh, I better check that out. So it goes out, checks it out and says, okay, well, it's a threat. It's not a threat or I don't know what it is or whatever. But then it goes, well, you know, I don't have any weapons left because I spent my munitions, right? So I can't shoot at it. So I'm just going to hide. I'm going to strategically retreat. Retreat. And it retreats back to, I believe it's the L2, the Lagrange 2 point, which is a, a gravitationally neutral point between the Earth and the Moon, where you can just like set something and it will be not affected by gravity. So it just sits out there and waits. And if you send it transmissions, it's like you're sending transmissions to a sat any satellite. When you send these transmissions to it, it doesn't know what it is, like you're sending the wrong commands. So I believe what it's doing is it's saying, well, I don't understand what you're sending me, so I'm going to send it back to you so you can see the error of your ways. And if you keep sending it messages, it says, well, I'm going to I'm going to delay what I'm doing so you can think about it somewhere, and then I'll send it back to you. And then they use prime numbers as, as the distance between the, the transmissions. You know, from your explanation there, it doesn't really sound like you are of the uh, camp that thinks this is some ancient alien satellite then, right? 
Oh no, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think it's an ancient alien satellite. I, I believe that it's an ancient people satellite. Well, did you see that story recently about it being blown up? Yeah, that's. I don't buy it. Of, yeah, so it seemed kind of hoaxy to me. And and you know the the other thing about it is that like with all the technology we have, even if the secret space program doesn't exist, I mean, if there was a bizarre satellite sitting up there, you know, you'd think that we'd check it out. Well, I think we checked it out, and I think it ran away when we tried to check it out. Because it, it's very good at dodging things. So I, I think it, that's why I think it has an AI on board. And it's been there for a really long time. And, you know, even if it's alien, right, I couldn't see some aliens sitting in there, you know, for the last, I don't know, 1960s till now. So what, 50, 60 years being trapped inside that thing for 60 years saying, well, I'm, today I'm, I'm kind of bored. Today I'm going to go check out the International Space Station. So I, I think it's robotic, but I think it's responding in a predetermined way. But I, I think it's very old. I can barely make it through eight hours of work, man. I can't imagine sitting in a place for 60 years. <laughs> I know. It makes no sense, right? That's the thing, right? When you look at this stuff and you look at UFOs, conspiracies, cryptozoology, you know, maybe not the occult so much, but, but at least the other stuff, you know, you kind of have to apply Occam's razor to it. The, the most simple, William of Occam, he had this theory that the most simple answer is probably the correct one. And I, I think that in, in conspiracy theory and, and in ufology, people gravitate toward the complex theory because, I don't know, they can sell books or something. But to me, I try to find the simplest theory. And the simplest theory would be, well, you have this thing that happened 15,000 years ago. The distances involved between the two cities were not that great. So you're basically going to fire a rocket vertically, and then it's going to go up and then fall down. With the amount of technology they supposedly had at the time, you'd think they'd be able to shoot it down. I mean, we can we can kind of shoot stuff down, and they appear to be more sophisticated than us. That's why I think it was a kinetic energy weapon. That and there's no radioactive residue. Well, if you're going to fire a kinetic energy weapon, you have to fire it from orbit. Yeah, and that's yeah. you know that's just as plausible as any other idea. Yeah. I mean, I don't see why mm-hmm. not. And like I said, I haven't read the book, so I haven't read your contribution to that there but it does yeah i would not argue against you on this one just because i don't know much about oh. the black knight other than it's maybe an ancient alien fixture in the sky it could but, be yeah you know it could be you know the the one thing that i do try to do no matter what is that i i try to to carry a healthy op, healthy skepticism and a healthy optimism and you know i i try to be skeptical where skepticism should be applied and i try to be optimistic where optimism should be applied and you know i think it'd be awesome if it was alien so i you know i hope it is but i don't think it is well speaking of aliens and ufology i know you just got back from contacting the desert was there anything noteworthy uh that came out of that event you know uh the the noteworthy thing that i heard was uh valley jacques valley you know valley he's a very famous a uh, UFO researcher. I mean, he's been doing it for a very long time. He's a computer scientist as well, and he's a, a venture capitalist. And, you know, he's got the cred. I mean, he, I don't know if you've ever seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind, mm-hmm. but the French, the Frenchman in the beginning, Francois Truffaut, he's supposedly playing Jacques Villy, that that's who he modeled that person after. And the character was written as Jacques Villy. So he's a very credible guy. And, you know, he, over time, he shifted to a kind of ultra terrestrial model versus aliens. But he, um, he was talking apparently about slag falling out of UFOs. So I find that very interesting. What do you mean that by these that? U- well, basically that these UFOs sometimes are flying around and they start to malfunction or there's some kind of an issue and they, they dump like molten metal out of the back. Huh. Is that something that nobody else has talked about at this point? It's or? been talked about a few times. Um, I forget the guy's name, but it's Shag, the Shag Harbor incident that happened, where they there was a UFO that was dumping slag out the back, and it, it like fell on the these guys were fishing. One of the guys is famous, and he's been linked to other things like the JFK assassination and all kinds of stuff. Well, and the the slag, these chunks of metal fell out the back of this UFO and like killed his dog. But they in the boat and they like punched holes in the boat and they collected a whole mound of it and they were like they were like analyzing it but he was saying that that the stuff that he had been exposed to where it actually had a chain of custody meaning that it fell out of the ufo and you could like plot who had touched it since then he was saying that that stuff when they chemically analyze it that it has a it has a consistency and a chemical composition that's not naturally found on the earth so that that led him to believe that they were alien in nature does that force him to rethink his ultra-terrestrial hypothesis then? 
I don't think so. You know, guys like Vali and, and Heineck and others who are, are very learned, what they've always claimed is that most of the things that we see are human in origin, but there's a good 10 or 15 percent that's that might be alien. And that's kind of the way I followed it. I try to adopt their model where I believe that probably 80, 85 percent, maybe even 90 percent of what we see is human. And then, you know, maybe 10 or 15 percent is alien. I mean, I, I've definitely seen things that that a pilot could not do, you know. I mean, I'm not going to I'm I'm not going to make a judgment whether we can build something that would do that. I think that's totally possible, but you know, I know for a fact a pilot could not <laughs> could not perform the aerobatics that I witnessed. So, of that 10 to 15% that, you know, maybe of alien origins, you know, who could this be coming from then? This segues into your new book as well, uh, The Secret Cold War in Space, but Maybe we could just speculate a little bit on who this 10 to 15 percent might be. Well, I mean, that's that's, you know, the minute you say it's aliens, right, it could be anybody. It's I mean, it's impossible to tell. You know, various people claim various things, but there's no definitive evidence one way or the other as to, you know, who comes from where. You know, I, I think that, that some of the aliens are misidentified. You know, I think that some of the, this is where I get a little kooky, so to speak, but I, I think that, that some of the aliens are misidentified. And I think some of the alien abductions we have are mill lab or MI lab or whatever, the military abductions and that there's screen memories. So, you know, out of actual aliens, I don't know. I mean, I've heard that there's a, upwards of 170 different aliens. So <laughs> I wouldn't even begin to begin to speculate on where they come from. I guess, uh, you know, Zeta Reticuli is popular, Alder Baron, Barnard Star, Alpha Centauri. I mean, I would go towards somewhere that's close because the amount of energy required to get here. So I would say probably Alpha Centauri or something like that. Right. I mean, you do talk about the Nordics in the book. Uh, I did want to yes. talk about them, but I assume that people haven't heard this before. So I know some people have, and I, I know that you've talked about it for years, but could you maybe <laughs> give us a, a crash course? Because I think of all the races, the Nordics, I find the most fascinating. Could you give us a crash course on, on who they are and where they're from? Sure. So this is the part where I get a little nutty. I argue that the Nordics are actually uh, Germans that were left the planet and went somewhere else. Uh, I've hypothesized they came, they went to Venus uh, for a lot of reasons, but I don't know. They could live in a space station. Who knows? But I believe that they're German in origin. One of the things that I, there are a couple of definitive reasons why I believe that. But I mean, you take Valley and Thor, you know, and Commander Don and Jill. They were three Nordic, quote-unquote, aliens that came to the Earth and supposedly had a meeting at the Pentagon. And, and apparently uh, the Pentagon has a record of them actually showing up. But, I, you know, you have to ask yourself a question. Now, I'm a hack, right? I'm a, I'm a researcher. I'm, I'm a hack. And, you know, I, um, I studied anthropology. And when I took linguistic anthropology, uh, one of the things, my professor was a bit boring, uh, it was one of my least favorite classes, but um, one thing that he drilled into our heads was this notion that when you give directions or when you name people or when you do things, there's a cultural imperative at work. And so I thought to myself, and, and the one other thing that he said, because, you know, in, in anthropology, it's not unheard of to use aliens as an example, right? Because it, they represent something that's that's otherworldly and doesn't conform to any of the rules that we have. And one of the things that he pointed out is that if, if you're an alien, you know, you're going to use your alien cultural imperative. Well, your alien cultural imperative is vastly different than the one he, that we have. Now, you and I, you know, we have a cultural context, right? We're both from the United States. You know, there's probably some years apart for us, when I was born versus when you were born, my experience growing up may have been different. You know, I grew up in different places than you did, but there, there, there are overarching cultural imperatives. For example, if I was going to name my son something, right, and I, I didn't want to get particularly out there, I'd name my son John, or I'd name my son Richard, you know, or I'd name my son Bill, Robert, or whatever, right? These are names that, that you, you know, you'd recognize, right? Well, when you look at those three, you've got Valiant Thor, Commander Don, and Jill, that it doesn't strike me as being particularly alien names. I mean, you would assume that they use some sort of bizarre name that we couldn't pronounce. Now, Billy Meyer did that. That when he said he talked to the talked to the Pleiadians, that the Pleiadians, you know, their names were like Sam Jays and weird names that nobody can come up with. But in the case of Valiant Thor, 
you know, if I'm an alien and I'm from Venus, because Valiant Thor said he was from Venus, if I'm from, I believe he did, if I'm from Venus, right, why am I going to name my son Valiant Thor? Valiant Thor is brave god of, Norse god of thunder. Well, I'm going to name my son Valiant Thor if I have some sort of a Norse cultural imperative, if I'm Scandinavian. You know, I, I knew a guy named Thor. Right. My name is Olaf. It's a Scandinavian name. My fam, my family's Scandinavian. I was named after my great grandfather. You know, I knew a guy who was named Thor. His, he was named after his great grandfather. A cultural imperative at work. Right. So if I'm an alien, why, number one, why would I name my son Brave Norse God of Thunder? Number two, why would I name my son Don and just space age it with two N's? And number three, if I'm an alien, why would I name my daughter Jill? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, so that that's one part of it. And again, they claim they were from Venus. I'm willing to say, sure, they're from Venus. They're a bunch of Nazis on Venus. The other thing, though, that makes me believe that they're Germans is, uh, is a very little known fact. Now, when everybody's heard of Betty and Barney Hill, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they even had a movie, na- movie made about it with uh, James Earl Jones called The Interrupted Journey. When Betty and Barney Hill were abducted, I believe Barney Hill had been in the military. And when... When that thing landed, he got scared, and he had a Colt 45 in his car, and he pulled it out, and he started shooting at them. And only when he had expended all of his bullets, then they came out, right? Well, when they took him on board, uh, the first hypnotic regression, well, that, by the way, expending all his bullets, that, that means that they understood that, that he would run out of bullets and how many he had. And an alien wouldn't necessarily understand what he was doing. Right, because they don't have a cultural context of a Colt 45 being pointed at them and the trigger being pulled. They just see this guy holding this thing and squeezing the trigger and loud noises. They don't necessarily equate what it would have been. Well, in the first initial hypnotic regression, the very first one that they don't really talk about a whole lot, when Barney describes being taken aboard the ship, he says that they looked like Nazis and that they were in black jumpsuits with silver piping, and they wore peaked caps. Well, that's a very common uniform for an SS, like an SS tanker. The uniforms that he described were basically SS tankers, meaning guys that were in the panzer units that drove tanks around. And they had peaked caps with skulls on them. They had these jumpsuits, black jumpsuits with silver piping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if that wasn't bad enough, they both described being led around the ship by an, a red-headed Irishman with a German shepherd. And the last time I checked, German shepherds and red-headed Irishmen were not very alien. Now, the, the red-headed Irishman is actually very important. And it's, it's a little known fact that in World War II, the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, actually sided with the Germans. They sent people to fight in Spain, uh, with the Condor legions, which were the, the, uh, Nazi German legions that went to support Franco. There was a unit there that was from the IRA from Ireland, Northern Ireland. There was a, um, an SS unit, uh, that actually fought in World War II with the SS that was Irish. And the IRA at that time was being equipped by the Germans. In fact, uh, the IRA used to routinely send people to Germany to be trained. So, like, the Germans would give the IRA a whole bunch of Panzerfausts, these, like, lollipop-looking things that were anti-tank rockets, right? Well, the IRA is like, we don't know how to use this thing. So the Germans were like, hey, come to Berlin. We'll show you how to use it. So they'd send people to Berlin. So here you have this very famous abduction, supposedly done by Grace from Zeta Reticuli, where you've got guys that Barney Hill described as Nazis. You've got a, you've got a, a German shepherd and a redheaded Irishman. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. And then when you start to look at the iconography of some of these UFOs, I stumbled across a um, a uh, article from Se- Sega Magazine from like 1974, and I want to say it was written by Otto Bender, but I forget now. But basically, it was a whole bunch of iconography from you know icons and, and images that were seen on the sides of these UFOs, and you know it's like stars. There was one that that's it looks like a, an F. It's called a Wolfschlegel. It's a German fascist uh, symbol there's a lightning bolt that looks like it was right out of the british of or the british uh, union of fascists you know other images that look that were used by the by the italian uh, fascist air force and so there's a lot of the, this iconography that exists on these ufos and then and by the way the one that looked like it was italian actually comes from the umo from the 
this very famous UFO sighting in Italy, that this symbol on the bottom of the, the UFO, the UMO, uh, it looks like a fascia symbol. You have other ones that look like the, the crossed axes, um, fascia symbol. And then you have a whole bunch of them where they have like Roman alphabet letters, like, you know, like US and then four numbers like printed on the side of it or, or are you are you s and then four letters or you know uh uk and four letters or un and four letters and it's like if i'm an alien why am i putting english on the side of my ufo that doesn't make a lot of sense <laughs> no it does not no so, so i help, put i put the pictures in there help us understand then i want to go back to the origin of this this nordic race that we've been talking about because you're essentially saying that they're space nazis Right. Yes. Yep. Does that mean that that they're Germans who that they're Nazis who survived World War Two? You know, the whole route to Argentina and then to Antarctica right. and then to space, and they're yeah. they're human. Or is yes. I I know there's a theory out there that that the Nordics may have been actually created by the Nazis. There's a guy by the name of Walter Bosley, and and Walter changed my life a couple weeks ago. Walter is obsessed with the arrows. That's uh, the whole mysterious airships of 1897 and all that, NIMSA and all that stuff. Yeah. The Sonora Aero Club, etc. Walter um, has gone through the the uh, collages of this guy named uh, Delshow, who supposedly documented the um, the schematics of how the arrows worked uh, in collages, and he's gone through it with a fine tooth comb, and he found a arrow uh, dating to 1850 that appears to have the Nazi bell powering it. It looks like the Nazi bell. It has arrows pointing to the counter-rotating uh, counter rotating mechanism that supposedly creates the torsion, that creates the, the anti-gravity. I mean, it's all there. It looks like the bell. It looks like the bell that's on the, the cover of Joseph Farrell's Brotherhood of the Bell. So what that means is that they were using that thing to create electric gravitics and anti-gravity in 1850. And NIMSA, the the organization that oversaw the development of this, right, uh, was German in origin. Uh, Now, Walter tells this story much better than I do. I'm hacking it up, (laughs) but just to give you an idea. And, And supposedly there was a Prussian officer that came to the U.S. to oversee its development. And then he has a he has a whole bunch of books um, called Empire of the Wheel and uh, our friends from Sonora where he gets into this and it's his new book Origin where it really gets into it. But basically, what he lays out is this, is a model where this German organization in the 1850s started basically using the bell. And what that means is that by the time we get to the bell in, in 1940, which is when J- Jacob Sporenberg talks about it to the Polish intelligence service, you know, trying to save his life. Right. Because they were going to execute him. They, they did execute him. But, you know, he tells the intelligence service is all about this crazy program at Derisi, the giant, you know, in the in the mountains, a Skoda munition facility. There's this crazy bunker up there, which is true. There's the henge and they were tethering this thing to the henge. It was crazy. And, and then Witowski picks this up from his friend, his friends in Polish intelligence and says, hey, you want to hear a crazy story? Witowski goes, yeah, tell me about it. And Witowski wrote about it. Then you've got Nick Cook and you've got you know, Joseph Farrell and, and Jim Keith and Vladimir Tarzitsky and me and everybody else going bell, 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 bell. Right. But the original bell appears to have started to be in use in 1850. So that means that it was in use for 80 to 90 years before Sporenberg ever heard about it. Now, what that means is that the bell that Sporenberg heard about was not in development, as we've been led to believe, that they were trying to extend it. Now, that gives them quite a number of capabilities to leave town. But even if they didn't, there's a there's a an aircraft, they call it the America bomber. It's like a six engine transport that, um, Kamler, who's leading the project, he had access to, I think four of them. This thing had such a crazy range. Cause like I said, it was designed to bomb America. In fact, you can find photos on the internet that the Germans took from one of these things as they flew over New York, actually flew it across the Atlantic. They flew over New York and then they returned to Germany and they took aerial photos of New York trying to figure out how they wanted to bomb it. Well, with the range that this Junkers transport has, it could have easily made it to North Africa or anywhere in Africa, refueled, and then made it to Argentina or Antarctica with quite a bit of fuel to spare. 
But there's also a story that the the four engine version of it, that's a little smaller, had actually mid air refueled the six engine version in like 1941. So they could actually mid air refuel this thing as well. So you know they had the capability to pack up the Bell and whatever else they wanted to take. And between U boats, cargo U boats, which were modified mine mine layers but cargo U-boats and these transports to get everything the hell out of Dodge and to go to quote-unquote Base 211 or go to Argentina. And then from there, maybe they worked on it some more and then they took off because they would have known that sticking around here was not a good idea. So is it conceivable then that, I mean, they could have been leaving the planet almost a century before World War II even started? It's possible. Wow. You know, we don't know how sophisticated the 1850 version was, but I, I guarantee that by 1940, they sure they sure as hell had the capability because you've got 80 years have elapsed. 80 to 90 years has elapsed in the development cycle for that bell. So if, if what Walter has found, and that's Walter Bosley, if Walter, what Walter has found is accurate, which it appears to be, then, you know, it's a game changer. You know, it, it changes everything that they, they could have been going into space in 1939, 1940. That's just crazy to think that Nazis are flying around space, isn't it? It is. It's not all that comfortable. <laughs> you know, I hypothesize that we put SDI into orbit to shoot at them. So, right. You know. Yeah, you know, I I always think of that phrase from the Philip K. Dick book. I think it's in Valus, but you know where he says the empire never yeah. fell. Nope. And then I wonder what empire he's actually referring to, though. Well, also remember yeah. that, you know, the man in the high castle. Well, yeah. Is that story not so much fiction then, you know? Well, the man in the high castle, I mean, that's an alternate reality kind of thing. You know, that's right. an alternate history kind of book. I mean, that that is about, you know, possibilities and how reality functions and, you know, forking, forking probabilities and other stuff. So, I mean, yeah, that's perfectly possible because, you know, every day you make decisions while well, those decisions create forks, right? And you could have an alternate reality that runs parallel to your own where that, you know, you decided not to go to college. And so that creates its own path separate from the one where you did go to college, right? That's right. some heavy math <laughs> more than I can do. Yeah. Hey, you uh, mentioned Antarctica and Base 211. You know, you talk about this in the book along with Operation High Jump. Could right. you describe what those are? And then, I don't know, you know, I haven't really talked to anybody about Antarctica yet at length, but maybe speculate on what's actually happening down there right now? Sure. Well, basically, Base 211 is supposedly what they called the base down there. And, and for a long time, the German base down there, quote unquote, New Schwabenland. And the, the Germans had sent a number of Antarctic expeditions down there. And it's an area of Antarctica that nobody goes. And they say, well, it's a wasteland or whatever, but everybody stays on the opposite side of this mountain range from it. And supposedly, the Germans went down there and uh, they built some sort of a facility. And for a long time, people poo-pooed it and said, no, the Germans wouldn't have done that and and that it's asinine. It would have expended too much energy to do it, yada, yada. And then recently they found a bunch of uh, bases that the Germans had built up in, in the Arctic. And, you know, they went up there and they excavated it and they found books and uniforms and guns and uh, spent uh, fuel cylinders and all kinds of stuff. So the Germans were definitely capable of it. Um, for my money, in, in Antarctica, they've always found weird stuff around there, weird heat traces and energy readings and weird lights and other stuff. And so... What I think happened is that in the, as the Third Reich was collapsing, you know, you've got an exodus of the German hierarchy using the rat lines that Otto Skorzeny set up, you know, migrating into Argentina. I mean, large, large numbers of them. They moved a lot of money and a lot of resources around and a lot of other stuff. So I think what they did maybe is that they, they had built a base down there um, where they could centralize the departure and maybe stockpile certain things they needed. And then, uh, you know, they they went, they left, and they there's probably the carcass of a base there. But I think they used it as a staging area, like a rally point. And then you had a lot of Germans that went to Argentina. There's a certain part of Argentina up in the mountains, you know, where it's, it's um, there's a lot of chalets, you know. There's a lot of German-speaking people there with German names. And the airport there, for a long time, was unmanned. It was just a simple, you know, rural airport, but it had this massive runway where you can land like an A320 on it. I mean, it was a big runway for a little tiny airport. 
So it was very strange. So I think, you know, a bunch of them just were like, you know what, I'm not going to leave. I like it here. I'm just going to hang out in Argentina. You know, Juan Perón was very, was a fascist and he was very um, open to their way of thinking. So they were safe there. You know, Otto Scorzani set up their, uh, their secret police system. So nobody was going to come after them and they could carry on doing what they do. But I, I think that, I think that they used Antarctica as a rally point. Maybe because of its position, maybe because it was a wasteland and people would leave them alone. There are a lot of reasons why they may have used it. Um, there weren't a lot of people there. But yeah, that's base 211. And then a uh, high jump. So Admiral Byrd, who had gone on expeditions into the Antarctic, uh, he did something called Operation High Jump. And basically what it ostensibly was is that they were supposed to go down there for like six months or four months or six months, I forget, and um, field test all this military equipment under harsh Arctic conditions, Antarctic conditions, and see how it performed. And so he goes down there, he's got all, you know, he's got thousands of soldiers, he's got tanks, and he's got uh, PBY Catalinas and submarines and all this stuff. And so they go down there and they do something. Nobody's entirely sure what exactly they did. They do something. And then two weeks, I think it was two weeks later, Bird's like, okay, we're all done. We're getting out of here. And he had done an interview, supposedly, although it's very hard to find. You know, the text is out there, but the actual article is is been lost the time i think but he did an article with an argentinian newspaper go figure where he said that they had come across something that they couldn't explain and they had these they had come across these some sort of an a, a militarized force that that basically pushed them back and so they left hmm. so what do you think is going on there right now because there's been a lot of interesting activity down there recently you know some political leaders going down there buzz aldrin just went down there a few months ago you know, it's hard to say. I mean, it's the only place on earth that's kind of multinational. You know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that it, it ties directly to the Germans, to the Nazis. I really don't know. I mean, it's there has been some weird stuff. I mean, even uh, oh, what's his name who does the cooking show on CNN, Anthony Bourdain. Even Anthony Bourdain went down there. Did he really? Yeah. And uh, Werner Herzog, who's a very famous kind of arty uh, German director, he went down there and he filmed these guys for like a year, you know, to, to like document what life was like down there. But I don't know. I mean, if I had to put any money on it, I'd say that it probably is more related to, to Alternative 3 than to the Germans. Well, that is a good segue because Alternative 3 plays a large role in your new book, The Secret Cold War in Space, which we mentioned earlier. Uh, right. And it's something that you've been talking about, or at least I've heard you talking about it for a couple of few years now. Uh, but maybe some of the listeners aren't really clued in as to what that is. So could you maybe give those of us who don't know what Alternative 3 is a, a nice introduction to that concept? Sure. So Alternative 3 was a TV show that was made by East Anglia TV in 1977. And supposedly it was supposed to be aired on April Fool's. It was supposed to be an April Fool's joke. But um, due to some strikes and other reasons that shall be nebulous, it was aired in, I think, August of 77. And basically what it is is it's a mockumentary. It has actors. Uh, this guy, Tim Brinton, uh, quit his job as a newscaster to star in the uh, in the movie and then went back to being a newscaster after that. And then uh, Brian Eno did the soundtrack. If you like electronica, a lot of the music on it is was it for uh, music for movies, I think. And, and it basically uh, purports to show that the powers that be know that the end of the world is coming, that it's going to be some sort of an ecological collapse, and that they it has been brought on by uh, climate change, and that they tried to stop it and they couldn't. So realizing that they couldn't stop it, they decided to pack up and move a bunch of people to Mars by way of the moon. So it is a mockumentary, um, but what I would argue to you is that it is factually correct. It is the truth prevent, presented as fiction. Alternative three is actually, you know, three steps or three three alternative plans, right? Could you take us through what those plans are? Sure. So there, there's a sequence where um, this guy, he's a professor, he's leading Tim Brenton through uh, what looks like a college. And he says something to the effect of, you know, ba I'm going to paraphrase just to keep it simple. Basically, in 1958, 1957, something like that, that the, the uh, American Chemical Society had a meeting, and it was at that meeting that they figured out that we were all screwed. And when I watched this, I thought to myself, you know, they're putting out, like, specific dates and specific things. I wonder if I can prove it, 
right? So I looked it up, and in 1950, I think it's 1957. In 1950, it's right in the book. Yeah, it's 57. The American Chemical Society had a meeting, and a guy by the name of Roger Ravel, who was uh, an oceanographer with the Scripps Oceanographic Institute, he presented a study showing showing that that phytoplankton these, um, we call them the oxygen scrubbers of the sea, right? When I was a little kid, they would tell us that these phytoplankton would process something like 90% of the carbon dioxide in the air. Well, these phytoplankton were only processing 50% of what they were supposedly capable of processing. And that based on that, and based on our, our industrialization pattern, that there, we were going to have a problem about 50, 50 years in the future, which we are. And so at that point, the powers that be figured out that we have a major problem in the the forest, the Amazon, and the old growth forests in California and Oregon and Washington and the phytoplankton and, you know, the trees and the, and the animals are not processing enough of this stuff. So, you know, somewhere down the line, it's basically going to cause a Venus effect or, you know, or some sort of a, like a greenhouse effect. And so they came up with three options. And I would actually argue to you that there are four options. Uh, they call them alternatives. Alternative one was to detonate a nuclear weapon at high altitude so that the uh, carbon dioxide would vent into space. Now, I know that sounds ridiculous, but during the same time, these are the same brilliant minds that came up with Operation Plowshares, where they wanted to set off a chain of nuclear weapons to create another, you know, another Suez Canal. And they did a test where they, they lit up one of these nuclear weapons up in Alaska to make an artificial harbor. And they made this beautiful harbor, but you can't use it for like 10,000 years, right? <laughs> and anyway, yeah. so they, they came up with this plan. Uh, they rallied this massive fleet in like six months. It should have taken like two years or three years to get this thing all figured out. They did it in six months. Uh, they blamed on this guy named Christophilos, uh, who had hypothesized that if you set off a, a nuclear weapon at high altitude, that it would create an artificial Van Allen radiation belt, which would deflect um, radiation, solar radiation. So they go down to the South Atlantic. They fire off two of these things at high altitude, and they detonate them. And it's called Project Argus or Project, Project Hardtack Argus. And they fire them off, and it fails. The Christophilos effect worked. But venting that stuff in the space didn't work. So they had to go to alternative two. Um, alternative two was a massive bunker. And by the way, the Soviets did the same thing. We weren't alone. The Soviets tried it too. So then alternative two was to build massive bunkers. And so, I mean, I, I don't need, think I need to prove to you we build a lot of bunkers. Mm-hmm. And the Russians built even more than we did. In fact, the, the Soviets hollowed out two mountains. Uh, one is called Yamatow and the other is called Kosmatev. And supposedly there's a thing called the do- the dead hand switch that sits in Kosmatev, where if we get into a nuclear firefight, that if the command and control system is destroyed, that this thing will automatically re- launch a retaliatory strike against us. Maybe true, maybe not. But they did hollow out two mountains, Yamatow and Kosmatev. Anyway, so... I argue that there's actually another alternative in between the two called Alternative 1.5, which is geoengineering. And Edward Teller, who's the uh, the father of the hydrogen bomb, he wrote an article some years back called Sunscreen for the Planet Earth. And basically what he advocated, and this is in the 90s, I think, maybe it was the late 80s, but he, he advocated that we dump um, particulate in the upper atmosphere to change the reflectivity, the albedo of the Earth to deflect sun the solar radiation, which would reduce the um, the amount of heat on the surface of the Earth. So they launched a massive geoengineering program, and they're not that secretive about the fact that they're geoengineering. I mean, NASA just NASA just canceled a uh, a project where they were going to launch a couple of rockets up in the air and blow them up, and it was going to create like green clouds and red clouds. Well, this is the kind of stuff that they're doing, and so a lot of people now they talk about chemtrails. Well, chemtrails would be the dumping of the particulate into the upper atmosphere, and they do it all around the world. In fact, um, I saw an interesting documentary on a thing called global dimming, where the surface of the Earth is actually becoming uh, noticeably darker because there's less light uh, penetrating the upper atmosphere. And so right after 9-11 happened, um, when they grounded all the aircraft, that a whole bunch of atmospheric scientists went outside and they're like, oh my God, the first time in recorded history, there's no airplanes. So they, they started floating balloons and taking measurements. And like the, the temperature on the surface of the Earth increased by like half a degree in like three days. So it seemed to indicate that 
that uh, the geoengineering is taking place. And there, there are various patents that describe it, being able to, to take a fuel source and to be able to sift out something out of it and to eject it out of another port. I mean, you know, Rolls Royce and, and some of these other guys that build turbine engines that they, they actually have patents for how, how you can do stuff like this. So I think that that I, this idea that there's like a, a chemtrail fleet, I don't think it's true. I think they just mix it into the fuel, but chemtrails, you know, are real. I mean, even, Hey, even Prince talked about it. The late great mm-hmm. prince, he went on BET and was talking about uh, seeing chemtrails. But that's basically geoengineering. It's designed to cool the surface of the earth. Well, so then you have alternative two, which is bunkers. And then they figured out that the bunkers weren't going to work because you just can't house enough people. You just can't build enough of them. And living subterraneanly for decades is not really conducive to happy people. So they decided to go to the moon by way of the Mars or by to mars by way of the moon and there's plenty of evidence that there's weird stuff going on on mars on the moon but in the last few minutes of the alternative three uh film uh so it shows a supposed uh man landing on mars so it was like a joint soviet american mission and you know there's a voiceover that's really cheesy but from what i read the and learned that the the voiceover is a post-production thing that they stuck that on there just to decrease the plausibility of it but the actual film that you see them of landing on on mars is real and uh there's a part where they pan the camera down and they're looking at the surface of mars there's something moving and uh christopher miles who filmed it who was the director of the movie um i asked him how he did it and getting him to answer any questions about alternative three is really painful he really just does not want to talk about it but you know i was persistent and and i was respectful and i was nice and I finally got him to answer it through his agent. And he he said that he shot it on a card table and that he drilled a hole in the bottom of the card table and he stuck his finger through it and then he moved the dirt around. And I've talked to a number of effects guys who do physical effects. And two to one, they say that that's not possible. That what you're seeing couldn't have possibly been his finger going up through the bottom of a card table. So it's, you know, like I said, I think it's a blueprint. I think it's a blueprint for the end of the world, like how they plan on dealing with it and how they are dealing with it. And I think it explains a lot of things like the secret space program and a lot of the other stuff that that really confounds us. And, you know, my objective at the time was to to prove that Alternative 3 was the was the end game. And I think I did that. And basically with the Cold War in space, my I wanted to show what the Soviets were doing at the same time and to show that we weren't really fighting with them, you know, that there was no fighting taking place, that, that we were putting all this stuff in, into orbit and they were trying to go to Mars and we were trying to go to Mars and we were just trying to move stuff there. That it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it was nationalistic insofar that we're both trying to survive, you know, we want our, our ideology to survive it, but it wasn't, it wasn't aggressive. Well, that's a great explanation, man. Thanks for sharing that. And there's one more thing I wanted to touch on before we go here. And it kind of has to do with Alternative 2 with the bunkers, the deep underground military bases. You actually outline a connection between these underground bases and the missing people that David Politis researches. Yes. You call these batch consignments, and I'd love for you to just <laughs> throw that out here as just a All nice right. little cherry on top here for this conversation. Sure, sure. So in Alternative 3, they talk about something that's called a batch consignment. There were kind of like three classes of people up, up there, and one is like the the crews, right? The people who fly the fly these the UFOs or space planes or rockets or whatever they're using. There's kind of like the the people that fly them, the technicians, air traffic controllers, you know, the whatever. Then there's the VIPs, the are very important people, the rich people, the smart people, you know, that they decide to save. But, you know, functionally, if you're going to run an installation or you're going to run a society, you need an underclass. You need the guys who are cleaning the toilets and washing your laundry and cooking your food and serving it to you and that kind of thing. Well, in Alternative 3, they call them batch consignments. And the idea was that they basically kidnap people and take them up there and work them as slaves. So one day when I was writing the first book, I was looking at Pilates' work. And I've always been fascinated by Pilates' work because there are a lot of disappearances. I mean, it it's very high and nobody has an explanation 
You know, it's gone from like UFO abductions, military abductions to Bigfoot to cryptids of other kinds. And nobody really has an explanation. And so I finally saw a map that he had made where he had taken a map of the United States and he put little stickets where everybody was getting abducted. These are national parks, right? These are, yeah, in national parks. And the Nash, according to Pilates, the National Park Service will not attempt to explain to you what happens. And I mean, they're weird, they're weird abductions. Like there was one, uh, some people are like fully abducted. Some people are like just disappear for a while. There was one I remember where there was like a Boy Scout troop hiking and this kid went around the corner between two adults. And you're talking about like 20 feet. And the guy, va- the kid vanished. Then he appeared like, I don't know, like a week later, like, 60 miles away or something insane walking around in the forest like confused and couldn't tell you what happened or where he'd been he'd obviously been drugged somehow well so i took this map that polites had made with these little stickets and i was looking at it, i was thinking to myself i've seen that pattern somewhere and i could not figure out where i'd seen the pattern but i had seen that pattern somewhere and then it dawned on me there was a guy named tall and in 19 in the 1990s he was really big on, uh, you know, secret underground bases and UFO bases and, and, you know, the whole like underground rail system and stuff. And he had claimed and still does claim to this day that, that he had insight into where these things were. And so he may, had made a map and the map was of the West, the kind of West down through like New Mexico up to like Washington state, part of a bigger map. He made a number of maps, but this one in particular kind of had the West. And so I took his map in Photoshop and I took Polite's map in Photoshop and I stretched them out and I bent them until the the states lined up, right? Because in both maps it had outlines of like California, Nevada, New Mexico, Oregon, whatever. So I, I contorted the two maps until they lined up, which is it's not a hundred percent scientific, but it's directional, right? It shouldn't if I'm wrong, it shouldn't line up at all. Well it did. When I when I got the maps to actually line up. Wouldn't you know it, but all, at every point where there was like massive, a massive number of disappearances, that corresponded to what Tall said was a major rail terminal on this under, and, and a UFO base on this, this map that he had created. So here I've got these two maps that line up. And so it started to dawn on me, well, you know, I mean, the disappearances, look, there's supposedly a, a UFO base sitting under the, this location and look there's a whole ton of disappearances so then i started to go from there and i started to do more research but the initial part was me just looking at polity's map and going i've seen that before and when i lined them up they lined up pretty much bang on yeah man that's really (laughs) fucking coincidental or not but uh scary i've always yeah it's very scary and i've always found it interesting how they've determined you know the space for the national parks you know just like they're always these really remote just large land masses it seems and it's just yeah the fact that more people go missing in national parks than anywhere else is just really fishy well, and, and that the National Park Service will not acknowledge it. They half-heartedly investigate it, and then they, they have their own classification system. They classify it. They won't respond to FOIA requests. They won't respond to interviews. They won't talk about it. It's crazy. Have they gone on record and explained why they don't discuss this? No. No, they just ignore it. And and that's an intelligence thing, right? That, that, you know, in the intelligence services, they classify everything because they don't want to figure out what's safe and what's not safe. So they just classify all of it. And then they will not respond to your inquiries about it because it's classified. They say, well, I'm sorry, I can't talk about anything because it's classified. Well, can you prove, can you tell me if it exists? No, I can't because to even acknowledge its existence would violate its classification. So, you know, they, they took one from, from the intelligence services and they just classified the whole damn thing and they refused to talk about it at all. Hmm. And I, that's fishy. Yeah, it's very fishy. It is. And, and, you know, there's two kinds of rangers in the national parks. There's rangers who carry guns and rangers who don't. And the rangers who carry guns, you know, they're, they're federal police. And the rangers who don't, they're park rangers, right? You know, and, and, and that all makes a lot of sense. You know, you'd have to because, you know, who knows, they're dr- dealing drugs in Yosemite or whatever. But it's, it's obvious they have an intelligence service inside the National Parks Service and, and, it just boggles my mind that they don't ever address it, that they simply say, well, there was a hiker lost and we found him. Hooray for us. They don't talk about anything else. And you would think that, that they, they're aware of Politi's work, 
And so you think that they do something to acknowledge and go, well, you know, this guy, David Polites, he's he's full of it. It's not true. And then produce. I mean, even the Air Force did that half heartedly for Roswell. They're, you know, here's the Roswell's dummies or whatever. I know it took them like 50 years to do that. But, you know, at least the Air Force at some level has acknowledged it even. You know, they made fun of it. And that's fine. But at least they're responding to it. In the case of Polites stuff, they don't even respond to it. It's just a black box. Right. Hey, last question for you. You know, this podcast I do is called Occulture, and I was just wondering <laughs> right. what you think, what role you think the occult actually plays in all of this. You know, things like magic or astrology or alchemy or things like that. So I have a theory. My theory is this: is that everybody tries to figure out who the powers that be are, right? And I think I think it's the aristocracy. They they've been in power for two thousand years, and I, I just I. I put money on the aristocracy, and I, I think they use. I I think that they. I don't know if they're Luciferians or not. You know, a lot of people think they're Luciferians. I, I don't know. But what I do know is that that they are occultists. I mean, you look at the Hellfire Club and some of their activities and some of the activities that you know the kind of American aristocracy has done, and and they 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 do do occult things. And it's amazing that a lot of very important things that take place take place on occult days. And so I think definitely they use it. They practice it. I don't know how much they believe in it, but they use it structurally. All their timetables are occultish. The messages are occultish. You know, I mean, how many, how many rocket launches have been on, you know, occult dates, you know, dates that are significant in the occult. And again, I go back to things like the Hellfire Club and they use these secret societies um, who are predominantly occultish to to keep their secrets, to to send orders, to do activities, whatever. And I, I don't know if they use the occult as a system of control or if they use the occult because it actually is powerful or why, but they definitely use it. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about that, to be honest. Uh, no. There's just too much, again, correlation to dates oh, yeah. and numbers and things like that to just outright dismiss it. So That's very true. Well, anyways, uh, Olaf Phillips, man, it's way past my bedtime here. So I do, <laughs> yeah. I do appreciate your time tonight. Uh, tell people where they can keep up with you and your work. Sure. Uh, you can find us at, uh, paranoiamagazine.com. Uh, we're on Facebook as Paranoia, Paranoia Magazine. Um, we're on Twitter as Paranoia Mag. Uh, we're on Instagram as Paranoia Mags. And, you know, uh, you can visit the website paranoiapublishing.com. Uh, drop us a line, say hi. Um, you know, we're nice people. We actually respond. You know, we're not full of ourselves. We love talking to people who read our stuff and, and find it interesting and want to debate it or talk about it. Um, but yeah, that's where you can find me. Awesome. Olaf Phillips. Hey, man, thanks for your time. And thanks for having me on. It's a real honor. You know, I follow you on uh, Instagram and, and on Facebook. You know, you, you have some very interesting shows. So it's a really uh, an honor for me to come on. Hell yeah, man. My thanks again to Olav Phillips. Please do check out his work if any part of this conversation hits you in any of your feel spots. You know, I wish I had more time with Olav, but I wasn't lying when I said it was past my bedtime. We spoke around midnight on a Monday night a few weeks back, and he's out west, and I'm in Ohio, and we had to postpone a couple of times, so a 9 p.m. Pacific call was the only time we could squeeze this in. But, as I mentioned early on in the conversation, Olav has written and spoken about these topics for years, so if you're looking for more, do take a gander at his work. It's all linked in the show notes. And if you're doubting any of this story, totally understandable. For example, Nazis building a base in Antarctica may seem far-fetched, but there's some recent evidence that it may have been true. If you go back and listen to episode 5 with Peter Biebergall, I do share a news story that was reported worldwide about Nazi artifacts being discovered in the Arctic near the North Pole. Olav actually mentioned this news story during our chat if you caught it. It's also long been hypothesized that several high-ranking Nazis, including Hitler himself, survived World War II and escaped to Argentina, which again, may sound far-fetched if you haven't heard that before, but wouldn't you know it, another worldwide news story broke just recently on June 20th about a discovery of a large collection of Nazi artifacts found in the home of an art collector in Buenos Aires, the capital of Argentina. Now, this was a story published by the Associated Press and picked up by several major news outlets, ABC News, USA Today, Fox News, CNN, Newsweek, The New York Daily News, Forbes, Huffington Post, just to name some of the American outlets that picked it up. So, in the spirit of this conversation, I want to share this story with you. The byline on it is from Deborah Ray of the AP, and the dateline is June 20th from Buenos Aires, Argentina, like I said. 
And Deborah writes this. In a hidden room in a house near Argentina's capital, police believe they may have found the biggest collection of Nazi artifacts in the country's history, including a bust relief of Adolf Hitler and magnifying glasses inside elegant boxes with swastikas. Some 75 objects were found in a collector's home in Bacar, a suburb north of Buenos Aires, and authorities say they suspect they are originals that belong to high-ranking Nazis in Germany during World War II. Our first investigations indicate that these are original pieces, Argentine Security Minister Patricia Bullrich told the Associated Press on Monday, June 19th, saying that some pieces were accompanied by old photographs. Bullrich said this is a way to commercialize them, showing that they were used by the horror, by the Führer, there are photos of him, Hitler, with the objects. Among the disturbing items were toys that Bulrick said would have been used to help indoctrinate children, a large statue of the Nazi eagle above a swastika, a Nazi hourglass, and a box of harmonicas. Police say one of the most compelling pieces of evidence of the find's historical importance is a photo negative of Hitler holding a magnifying glass similar to those found in the boxes. We have turned to historians and they've told us it is the original magnifying glass that Hitler was using, said Nestor Roncaglia, the head of Argentina's federal police. We are reaching out to international experts to deepen the investigation. The photograph was not released to the public, but was shown to the Associated Press on the condition that it not be published. The investigation that culminated in the discovery of the collection began when authorities found artworks of illicit origin in a gallery in northern Buenos Aires. Agents with the International Police Force Interpol began following the collector and with a judicial order raided the house on June 8th. A large bookshelf caught their attention and behind it, agents found a hidden passageway to a room filled with Nazi imagery. Authorities did not identify the collector who remains free but under investigation by a federal judge. There are no precedents for a fine like this. Pieces are stolen or are imitations, but this is original and we have to get to the bottom of it, said Roncaglia. Police are trying to determine how the artifacts entered Argentina. The leading hypothesis among investigators is that they were taken to Argentina by a high-ranking Nazi or Nazis after World War II when the country became a refuge for fleeing war criminals, including some of the most widely known. As leading members of the Third Reich were put on trial for war crimes, Joseph Mengele fled to Argentina and lived in Buenos Aires for a decade. He moved to Paraguay after Israeli Mossad agents captured Holocaust mastermind Adolf Eichmann, who was also living in Buenos Aires. Mengele died in Brazil in 1979 while swimming at a beach in the town of Bertioga. Police in Argentina did not name any high-ranking Nazis who might have originally owned the objects. Ariel Cohen Sabin, president of the DAIA, a political umbrella group for Argentina's Jewish institutes, called the find unheard of in Argentina. Sabin told the AP, quote, Finding 75 original pieces is historic and could offer irrefutable proof of the presence of top leaders who escaped from Nazi Germany. And that's the end of the story. Now, we should find it curious, at least I do, that this was picked up in an era where mainstream American media is so tightly controlled by and supposedly linked to the CIA through Project Mockingbird. However, what we have here is confirmation in the mainstream American media that high-ranking Nazi officials did live in Argentina after the war. I don't know if this has ever been confirmed in the mainstream American press before. I don't recall seeing such a, a, a widely covered story like this, but maybe it has been. And please do correct me if I'm wrong here. I know that, you know, for example, if you look up Joseph Mengele on Wikipedia, it does mention his time in Argentina after the war, but, you know, that's Wikipedia, and this is major American news outlets. So, again, I'm just, I'm not sure if there's ever been this much widespread attention on this sort of a story, which has been hypothesized by conspiracy, I'm using that in quotations, conspiracy researchers for years. But even if there was prior confirmation of this, what's more curious is the linking of some of the objects found directly to Hitler himself. A magnifying glass was found, if you remember, and this was supposedly Hitler's personal magnifying glass. Also, photos were found of him with several of the other objects that were discovered. Now, I'm going to quote Dr. Joseph Farrell here. Some of you know of Dr. Farrell or perhaps follow his work over at Giza Death Star. And Dr. Farrell wrote this a few days ago. As someone who has spent years investigating the story of post-war Nazi survival in some detail, I always have to laugh when stories like this capture the attention of the corporate-controlled lamestream media who always manage to make this story about isolated fugitives of relatively low rank like Eichmann or Mengele. Occasionally, as in this article, they show us pictures of the house or the Nazi stuff in it and we're supposed to be appropriately awed and creeped out that anything like this would survive anywhere, much less be collected by anyone. And that's the way we're supposed to react to this story. We're not supposed to read between the lines. Which, of course, I, 
Dr. Farrell did, and am about to do again. Notice two things here. One, the timing of this find, and two, the implications of what was found. For if one reads the statements about the magnifying glass carefully and in conjunction with each other, what they are saying is, A, we found a magnifying glass, B, it looks like the same magnifying glass in a picture of Hitler holding a magnifying glass, and C, this could therefore be Hitler's magnifying glass, and we're checking into the possibility with experts. The implication of this? G, this may be Hitler's magnifying glass, insert nervous chuckle here. G, I wonder what it's doing here in Argentina and how it got here, insert another nervous laugh. I initially bought the story that Hitler died in the bunker under the Reich Chancellery in Berlin in 1945 as the victim of suicide. And why shouldn't we believe the story? After all, all the people reporting the story were Nazis, and we know what paragons of virtue and truth they were, right? It was precisely that little problem that has caused many researchers to examine the suicide in the bunker story, and while we may be disagreed on the details of his escape, there is mounting evidence that he did make it out of Berlin and spent some time in South America, perhaps with artifacts such as these. For the hint of the article, at least with respect of the magnifying glass, is that it was Adolf Hitler's magnifying glass, and that implies that some of the rest of the trove might also be his personal possessions. Which brings us to the question of the timing. A number of people who shared various versions of this story with me, including Richard Hoagland, wondered about the timing of the find. Why now? I have no easy answer to that, but it is intriguing that this would be discovered and released now amid a climate of growing tensions in Europe over Angela Merkel's austerity and immigration policies, amid growing tensions between Washington and Berlin over Russia, and over Europe's very evident desire to move to closer relationships not only with Russia but with China. Here it may be a case of, you tell me. For why, now, would anyone want to draw attention via these not-so-subtle means to the potential survival of Hitler after the war and to treasure troves of Nazi memorabilia hidden in a secret passageway behind a bookcase in Buenos Aires? And that's the end of Dr. Farrell's commentary on this. The reason I share this is because I had the same sentiment. But I wanted to give the good doctor credit because he did publish this a few days ago. In fact, I contacted Dr. Farrell rather hastily as I was recording this because I thought it'd be cool for him to just come on the show for a quick cameo and run down his thoughts on this. But he hasn't replied yet, and he may not at all, and I had to get this show out. So my apologies for not getting him on here. Regardless, the timing of the story is curious when considering the current geopolitical climate across Europe and the linking of the magnifying glass to Hitler could really take this story in an interesting direction in the next few months. That's provided this remains a story, and that's provided this investigation continues. And I'm using air quotes when I say investigation. Of course, this story is nothing new to folks like Dr. Farrell and to the many others who read about and research these subjects. I have to say, too, that my personal narrative of what I think happened during World War II seems to fit in rather nicely here. Now, I've never shared this on air, and I can't remember sharing it with anybody, to be honest. This is equal parts irrational and conspiratorial, but long theory short, all wars seem to be banking wars. And I surmise that Germany was trying hard to thwart the European banking cartel, which coincidentally does happen to be Jewish, and I suspect that a deal was cut that allowed high-ranking Nazis to escape in exchange for their technology, which was far more advanced than the rest of the world, and also their mind control techniques, which I would guess was a focal point of research in their concentration camps. This leads us nicely into Project Paperclip, when the U.S. government brought over several top Nazi scientists after the war, which not only ramped up the American space program, but also the deep state's interest in mind control. Now look at all the black projects that we know of. They're all post-World War II. They all seem to have started in the 50s and the 60s, and they all seem to have something to do with high technology or mind control. The German word for control, by the way, is spelled with a K. K-O-N-T-R-O-L-L-E. So MK Ultra, for example, would stand for Mind Control Ultra. To me, that's a dead giveaway the American deep state's interest in mind control was inspired by what they learned from the Nazis. Anyway, whew, I'm getting a little fired up here, and uh, again, it's nearly past my bedtime, so I gotta get out of here. But I just wanted to share that story with you, food for thought. If you liked what you heard, please do consider supporting the show by visiting oculturepodcast.com support. You can make a one-time donation in an amount of your choosing, or you can sign up for one of our seven levels of monthly support. I do take these donations through PayPal, but I am gearing up for a Patreon campaign, which will allow me to offer a bonus content to our supporters. I won't turn down the support now, but you should probably wait until the Patreon campaign is live so you can get some extra content and also some merchandise when it's ready. More on that in the next couple of months. 
If you enjoyed the show but you're hard up for cash, no sweat, maybe hop on iTunes and throw up a good rating for us. That helps more listeners find us on iTunes and other platforms. So that, to me, is just as good as any monetary support you could offer. I also want to let you know that I'll have a solo episode coming up in the next few days. It's inspired by my recent conversation with Dan Willis in episode 29, and also partly inspired by this conversation with Olav here as well. I'm calling it a footnote to these episodes, so be on the lookout for that. And then after that, I'll be delivering you guys the longest O'Culture episode to date, three hours of uninterrupted, orgasmic pleasure. I can't wait to get that one out there to you. Until then, though... You've just been initiated into O Culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.